the public session of this year's curatorial leadership summit titled what for those of you who were not here this morning uh, this whole curatorial leadership summit has been called what's in the x making sense of the latin american and latina latino latinx debate the aim of this summit is to identify and discuss the challenges confronted by artists curators museum directors and art markets professionals while trying to navigate these complex fields of art historical and curatorial practice. For the present session, I am joined by my colleague, Gilder Vicario, recently appointed Chief Curator of the Perez Art Museum, Miami. Yay, Miami! <laughs> Yay, Franklin! Go, go! <laughs> Gilbert joined the Phoenix Art Museum in 2015 as the Selig Family Chief Curator. Recent projects at the Phoenix Art Museum include Desert Rider, an exhibition of indigenous and Latinx artists from the Southwest, Stories of Abstraction, Contemporary Latin American Art in the Global Context, which featured gifted works from the Nicholas Pardon Collection in Irvine, California. Upcoming exhibitions include Pacific Gold, the 2022 California Biennial at the Orange County Museum of Art, and Chican AOX Body, co-curated with Cecilia Fajardo Hill for AFA in New York. In 2006, Vicario was named U.S. Commissioner for the International Biennale of Cairo, where he curated the exhibition Daniel Joseph Martinez, The Fully Enlightened Earth Radiates Disaster Triumphant very apocalyptic title. <laughs> Nothing else you can expect. Um, Gilbert and I, in turn, will have the privilege of engaging in a candid conversation with artist Daniel Joseph Martinez about key moments of an artistic pra practice spanning four decades. As many of you know, Daniel just completed his third participation at the Whitney Biennial, and so this is an extremely appropriate moment to engage him in his practice. And actually, he has not finished the participation because they extended it. So anyone who wants to go can still see his installation on the sixth floor of the, of, of the Whitney. Daniel Joseph Martinez is an artist who lives and works in Los Angeles and Paris, France. He's the Donald Brand Chair Distinguished Professor at the University of California, Irvine, where he has taught for the last 32 years. Martinez's work interrogates social, political, and cultural wars through non-linear, multidimensional actions and object production that range from ephemeral to solid and are not bound by any single singular category or theory. His practice takes the form of aesthetic, theoretical, and philosophical interventions that unapologetically question issues of personal and collective identity, vision and visuality, race, class, and the socio-political boundaries present within American society. Daniel has had 30 solo exhibitions worldwide and has been included in over 250 group exhibitions. He has represented the U.S. in 19 international biennials, including the Venice, Istanbul, Berlin, Moscow, and Havana biennials, as well as three Whitney biennials, to name a few. He also represented the United States in the American Pavilion at the Cairo Biennial in Egypt. Martinez has received two Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles and the Cisneros Fontanals Art Foundation in Miami, Florida. He's a recipient of both the Berlin Prize and Rome Prize and has participated in numerous residency programs in the United States and Europe. Martinez's work can be found in public collections in the United States, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, LACMA, the Getty Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Daniel, welcome to the Armory's Curatorial Leadership Summit. Thank you very much. So we would like to begin this conversation by referencing uh, key moments mm -hmm. of your uh, artistic trajectory. And I would like to start with the work that launched into U.S. national attention in 1993. I refer, of course, to Museum Tags, or the work that was commonly known as Museum Tags. The real title is Museum Tags, Second Movement Overture, or Overture from Flack, Overture with Higher Audience Members of 1993, which was an extremely controversial intervention and performance piece that you showed at the Whitney Biennial. 
In a recent interview, he described it as, and I quote, an atom bomb that went off in the museum, end of quote. The work addresses, addressed issues of identity in a conceptual, non figurative way, and it deviated from them. It, 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 was, it was done at the height of the multicultural debates uh, of the 1990s, but really deviated from them in its reliance on performance and language as a, as a, as a vehicle for artistic expression. So, can you talk about the political and social and cultural factors that led to the production of this piece and its reception by the mainstream audiences? Okay. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Mark Harmon and Gilbert. And perhaps it's important just to say that uh, the three of us have known each other for quite a long time now, almost going on 20 years. And Gilbert and I and Mark Harmon and I have worked on multiple projects over these past 20 years. We've also, both of us, in different occasions, have spoken in public together. And this, I see, for me, is a part of a continuing, ongoing dialogue that we've been having about issues that we think are pertinent and important. And, um, you know, allow us to engage in the dialogue that are necessary. So, uh, once again, I'm happy to be here with you, and hopefully we can uncover a few things. And we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, the Whitney Tags is sort of... Uh, It's difficult to talk about this piece at this point. Uh, next year, this work will be 30 years old. So we're really talking something, talking about something that is historical. Um, and I think it's difficult to understand the work because it, the work bifurcated itself. In other words, there are two versions of the work. One version of the work, the only version of the work that I, in a sense, authenticate, is the performance work that happened at the Whitney Biennial. So if you do not go to the Whitney Biennial in 1993, you do not understand the work. It's impossible to understand it if you were not there. What ended up happening was another work was born, which is the documentation of the remnants of a work, which then all of a sudden took on its own life. But we can't even understand this unless we think a little bit about the difference between then and now. So I'm going to just give you a brief analysis of that. Um, there have been e extraordinary texts by in incredible authors and artists who have written about the 80s and the early 90s, which I would argue is probably one of the most pivotal and important periods in American art history, period, without question. Something happened during this time that has never taken place ever before, and I will get to that. The most obvious distinction between then and now is that we forget. Nothing that you know now existed then. You live in a completely digital world now. In, in the 1980s and early 1990s, we were still completely analog. And you have to understand that what, you, what we understand as being contemporary now was different then. So, for example, we did not have the internet. We did not have cell phones. There, there, was, there was no... Um, there was no way to communicate that you did not communicate directly. You had to interact with people. The analog nature of the way that the world existed then was slower. So what we're talking about is, the, is reception transmission, transmission reception. And we're talking about the speed of how these ideas move. So I'll give you a simple example. Now, with our phones, you have the most powerful device ever made. You can just Google anything you want and you get an answer for it. If you actually wanted to learn something in the, in the 1980s, you had to go to the library. The library, what an idea that is. You had to go to the card catalog. You had to actually know that you wanted to look at a book. You had to go to the library with intention. I'm going to get these books, I'm going to read these books, and I'm actually going to want to expose myself to ideas that perhaps I've never heard, I've never read, I've never understood. The sheer curiosity of wanting to be intellectually enriched to understand the critical position that is necessary in order to author and render meaning in the world. Now, I mean, I've seen people, they, they turn on their phone and they look at some of the entire retrospective on their iPhone. When before, you wanted to look at art in the 80s, you actually had to go to an exhibition. You had to go in the exhibition. You had to walk from artwork to artwork to artwork and look at the actual work. You didn't look at an image of it on about this big. 
So, that means I'm, I'm, if anyone has known me for any period of time, I am pro technology. It's not that I'm not anti technology at all. We live in a different era. So, we have to understand that the way that we consume ideas now is completely different. The way that we read is completely different. The way that we view art is completely different. So, you can't understand. If you, are, if you were not born, say, by 1980, you don't understand what I'm talking about because there's no way to, to experience the nature of what, what happened in the 1980s. The 1980s and the early 90s, we, one, I'm going to remind you that in, you know, in the United States, we had two, two terms of Ronald Reagan. You, can, you, you have to remember what this means. Bush was the vice president of Reagan. This was the beginning, not the beginning, beginning, but the beginning of the Republican Party in a cultural war that was being made here in this country. And to understand this cultural war, you understand that that's how we got where we are today, because it began then. It actually began with Nixon, but it's a different conversation. The, so you have Reagan, and you have, you have the 1980s, most of us of my generation who were of age during this time, we were a product of May 68. We're a product of seeing civil rights. We're a product of trying to critically analyze and to utilize new tools. The word new genre was invented. It came about in the 1980s because there was an explosion of ideas. There was an explosion of experimentation. People were wild. It, you, you had the manifestation of art that was nobody had ever seen, nobody understood, and people were actively engaged in radical discourse. You had a, a, a decade of warfare. You had a decade of resistance. You had a decade of fighting. You had a decade of joy and love and sorrow. And we saw each other at funerals. When, when the AIDS crisis happened, everybody gathered around and supported the, the, the LGBT community. When it was women's issues, everybody gathered around and supported women during this time. When it was the height of multiculturalism, we had no, the, the, the kind of tribalism that exists today did not exist in the 1980s. You had a time of extraordinary support and extraordinary interaction between people. We were not divided by tribalism. We were not divided by aesthetics. We were not divided by sexual ideas. We fought and lived and died because we believed there was an opportunity to intervene in the American discourse of museology and aesthetics in a way that had never happened. It was a single moment when a shift, a, a, a paradigm shift occurred when the exclusionary practices of museums and galleries in the United States had to reckon with the fact that minority communities in the United States said no. That was it. No more. We are, we, if you don't want to invite us in, we will make our own, we will, we will generate our own discourse. This is why you have so much post colonial discourse at the time. That's why you had so many different kinds of theoretical, critically based ideas, philosophy, critical thinking. Uh, psychoanalysis, all the tools that we use in order to think about art, these are the tools that we invented. These are the tools that we use in order to create the language that did not exist. Alternative spaces. Alternative spaces, many of these things. And it was just, it was an extraordinary period of time. So when people ask me about the Whitney Tags, okay, not because you get too far, right? <laughs> it's, um, because it's an important period. I mean, you, it, it's very important that you remember what, if you weren't old enough, you don't know, you don't know, you should look it up. But if you're old enough, you can remember what I'm talking about. Okay, and so, the Whitney Biennial, without question, is probably one of the most visionary exhibitions that ever took place. Donald Goldman is a genius. Quite simply, there, there was an idea to intervene in the music, the museological stance, and suggest, and I use the word minorities as, a, as, a, as something that's crystal clear. I, 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 the, the language of today is too divisive for me. And so when I say minorities, I mean all of those who are disenfranchised. LGBT community, women, ethnic minorities. We have no place, and so the only way we can have a place is to make a place. Thelma, in the 1993 biennial, she saw the discourse and the, and the scholarship that was being developed, she understood the critical theory that was being used, and she capitalized that on making the first museum exhibition ever in the United States that was completely inclusive. And inclusive in a way that is not the kind of inclusivity that we're talking about currently. We're talking about inclusivity that 
knew no boundaries, it knew no categories, it knew it, did, it was not trapped by the language of uh, it was a danger in language because I think that we tended not to know and our inability to communicate sets up another kind of discourse. Nonetheless, language of correctness. Uh, what is that? Correctness. Correct. That, that would be one way to phrase it, yes. <laughs> uh, correctness is I'm not sure whose correctness it is, right? But the times themselves, they're difficult. So, the way the times themselves, which I, I never understood why so much of the confusion about what the times actually did. The times were, if you read the title, as my opponent did, it suggests right away that it uses an operatic structure. Second, all you have to do is pay attention to museum tags and understand that it is an appropriation of the pre existing tags that are used as an, icono an iconography by which to determine the day it would be in the museum. Okay? This is a structure, so it's very easy to see that this is a post Duchampian appropriation of something. It's a, it's, a, it's a slight move over from something that existed. Take away the WMAA and replace it with a set of, of, of broken phrases on each tag. Words, one or two words in each tag. This is based clearly, and I've said this for 30 years now, is based on a man named Sassoul, who was a French linguist at the late, late 19th century, early 20th century. But he was doing comparative analysis of linguistics of different languages in the world, predominantly focused on Europe. And he made an interesting suggestion. He says, by subtly moving words and sentences, you can create new meaning. The performance of the Whitney Tags was simply, you were given a tag when you went into the museum. The tag had a fragment of a, of a sentence on your lapel. Based on how you look, based on what you're dressed, based on if you have a t-shirt on that has a text on it, based if you're tall or short, you're black, you're white, you're Asian, you're native, Whatever it is that you did makes us, which makes us all look different in this room, all of a sudden you have an operatic performance of people of a textual manipulation in the room. It language moves. So you have somebody wearing, you have a woman wearing a tie that says to be. It's a fragment of an idea. It's a way to create a critical discourse. It's a way to create and render new meaning the linguistic manipulation of the language. The linguistic manipulation of the language then, for me, was, a, was a, a, attempting to trigger within the audience it, the, the, the assertion of the racial categories that we had been working with had to be erased. They needed to become obsolete. The divisions that we have is the same as looking at the kind of post human position. In order for us to evolve as human beings, we have to eliminate everything that we have known and it's structured and kept us back. So one of the ways of doing it was asserting that race, gender, and sexuality are constantly evolving. They're constantly in movement. They are actually not definitive. They are not, they, they are not the only thing that defines us. We are defined by what we do. We are defined by what we accomplish. To, to allow ourselves to be categorized in a way that limits our ability to render meaning seems then ultimately problematic. And the, the Whitney Tags is an attempt to dislodge the position of essentialism, basically. Any kind of essentialized thought, any kind of essentialized relation, racial position, it, it needs to be eliminated. This was an attempt to do that. But unfortunately, the work was that the time I'm sure you know, says I can't, on one, imagine of a wanting to be white. White was not necessarily a racial category, even though it's how it's interpreted. It could be interpreted that way, but it's looking at a power structure in the United States, it's looking at white supremacy. It's looking at the, the majority minority discourse. This is why a minority discourse is emerging in the 1980s is the, is the language and the theory and the criticality that we have. It, that's how we've gotten to where we are today. So the, the, the tags are a phenomenon. I mean, the, 30 years now, there are people still talking about this piece, they're still debating what this piece means, and there's, there is no definitive definition of it. Unfortunately, the performance ends and the museum the tag the show is over, and all we have is an image now on the internet of the line of tags, and all of a sudden that is what the piece is. It has nothing to do with the piece. It's a resume. It's a photograph. That is not the performance. It's not the, it's not the intellectual critical position that the work wanted to occupy. 
the objective of the work is to critically call into question all power relationships. Period. That's it. It begins there and it ends there. Critical thinking to make an analysis of the position that we're in. And the only way we can get out of the position that we're in is to continue to assert more criticality and more critical thinking. And this was the attempt. But I'm not alone in this. You look at the way by any you look at the artists in there, everyone is doing what you said, Mark Tony. This is a non figurative approach to conceptual ideas to deal with the issues of race and class in America. You did not have figuration in there. It, it, it was it, it, because we were a generation of artists who learned the new language of art. We invented a language of art. We were no longer dependent on our own essentialized identity by which to, to, to render a position. Well, that, that's what is uh, groundbreaking about you know, what you did, and you say that a lot of people were doing that, and it's true. But also, in terms of, you know, you have a Chicano background, you come from a Chicano uh, background and identify yourself to a certain extent as a Chicano. And most Chicano artists, I mean, even Latino and Latinx artists, what they call Latinx artists today, were dealing with these issues of identity, trying to deconstruct identity or deconstruct identity with visible markers of identity. You know, they were drawing from portraits, self-portraits, you know, all, all the um, identifiers of the community, the bodega, um, the, the particular landscape, yeah. a particular, you know, visual reference that were associated with the community. And yet, you were breaking away from that because you, you were doing a far more conceptual uh, statement based on language, based on Cecilia theory, based on your own uh, studies with Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School. Uh, so how do you reconcile your Chicano identity with this new uh, criticality, if you did or not? And was there an expectation, you know, from your community about the fact that you had to uh, be a Chicano artist and express yourself in a certain way? What kind of pushback do you get? Yeah, I mean, I've heard variations of this question, but today <laughs> and, and at the time, but think about the question for a minute. Right? And you're asking the question to be provocative, but think about the question itself for a second. That as an artist, regardless of how I identify myself, there's a prerequisite expected of me. There's, a, there's already, I say that I'm a Chicano artist, and all of a sudden, I'm expected to make work that follows a particular line of thought. It represents a visual representation that looks a certain way. I categorically reject this idea. I categorically have to reject it. I, I demand for myself my aesthetic freedom and my intellectual autonomy. I will make work about what I want, when I want, as I choose to make the work. I will not be, have my ideas be predetermined regardless of that. I'm no less Chicano because I make conceptually driven work. That, that my identity has nothing to do with my relationship with making art. I am an artist first, and I've always been an artist first. But I, yes, I am also Mexican American. I am also Chicano. You know, I, I I grew up in the 1950s. I was born in the 50s. I'm 66 years old now. I mean, it, 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 the question is absurd to me. That there, that there is that there is that, that, that we that we have to make a certain kind of work. Or, or what does it mean to be Chicano? I don't even know what it means. So, there's a, so then you have an image. So I'm, I'm an artist first, I'm not Chicano, and I'm getting maybe I'm Chicano. But if you put Chicano in front of artists, then all of a sudden there's a, you have an idea of what you think that means. What does Chicano mean? What does it mean? Does it mean low rider cars? Does it mean, uh, mean being gang members, drug lords? I mean, all of the, the extraordinary negative representations in film, in, in, in literature. I mean, it's, it's horrible. I mean, even recently, the vice the president Bill Biden, the yeah. president's wife was in Austin, Texas, and she said, I love the contribution by Latinos. The breakfast taco is the best thing that they have done. We just go, wow, the breakfast taco, that's, that's what they think we have contributed as Latinos in this country. Like, we're fucked. We're subtly fucked with this the way you think what, what we, our contribution is. Are you insane? I mean, really? I mean, the fact that we don't recognize as Latinos that we are we are invisible in this culture. We are completely, we have been rendered invisible. We are not even part of the cultural discourse in this country. We are seen as one thing and one thing only. We are a disposable labor force. We have been exploited as a disposable labor force, and we are continuing to be seen as a disposable. 
we are not, why, what, who asked why we're not involved in the museums and galleries and why this aesthetic does not sell well? It doesn't sell well because there is no aesthetic. You can't, you have to have an idea. You have to render meaning. You have to find a way by which to perforate the, 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 the cultural milestone that is holding people back. We don't participate. It's very simple. I don't know how to say that. Well, um, um, particular identity because it's so it's so fractured in so many different ways. Well, what is that? 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 It's clear. I'm a Mexican American. In fact, I would rather just be Mexican, to be perfectly honest. And just skip the American part of this. You know? Anyway. Moving on. Moving on. Let's let's talk about American art. American art, yeah. yeah. There's a. My favorite topic is American art. I I, I trust you, this is a a real segue. Let's talk about the idea of radical political action. Definitely a, a very strong thread, strong yeah. thread for me here. Um, and we're talking about all the piece that was part of the House of Revolution. Um, a fascinating relationship to American art and capitalism. Right. Um, and to a particular figure for me, uh, Arch Horschel and uh, Theodore Kaczynski. And, uh, and I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that project. Yeah, especially in as much as it happened after 9 11. Yeah, I mean, well, it's kind of funny you mentioned 9 11 that Sunday, right? Yeah. 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 And so, let's yeah. rewind. Yeah. If you notice the lights, I'm not too blind, but if you notice the lights, so they already started to project the light into the sky. You know, a memorial, we remember, right? We remember. That's, it's important that we remember. Our memory is what stores you know, our history. Our history is what educates us. We need history. We use history as a tool, right? Um, so, it's an important day on Sunday for all of us. Um, I think, I mean, you mentioned the Frankfurt School, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm get to you there. Okay, just a second. So I think one of the reasons that I approach the practice of art perhaps very differently, or not so much, I don't say well, maybe just through my own set of ideas is because I think perhaps it's my education that has made this different. So, you know, I, I went to Cal Arts, California School of the Arts, and 1974. So, yeah, I am a student of Michael Ashton. So, institutional critique. I, that, I learned first before I ever got into institutional critique. And institutional critique requires a whole set of tools by which to implement it. I was a student of um, Douglas um, Douglas Hubler. Thank you, Douglas Hubler. I was a student of John Bonsar, and essentially, what was considered the Fathers of West Coast conceptualism, I was there. There were myself and one black student who was a graphic designer, and one Chinese student who was in the photography department, and I was in our community. We were the sum total of the three minorities at Cal Arts in 1974. So you have to think about that for one second. What does it mean to survive in that environment? What does it mean to do well in that environment? So, post, so I, I, my entire relationship to art was always through critical theory. Always. It was always through challenging institutional structures. It was always to call into question, to challenge everything, to question everything. This has always been the premise of the work, particularly the institutions in America. Institutional critique, I did not do institutional critique the way that Asher taught it. What I did is I subverted it to make it to use from a minority position by which to then articulate a set of ideas that were not articulated before. But you mentioned Marcuse, so I get my Marxism directly from Marcuse, directly as a student of his. I was also a student of Klaus Rinka, who was the protege of Boyce. So I didn't read about Boyce in the book. I got Boyce directly from a student that he, he taught in a way, I mean, it was, it was everything that Boyce had he put into Rinka. Rinka taught me that directly. So my Marxism comes straight from the Frankfurt School, it, my, my social sculpture, 
my thinking, political thinking, the, the political analysis of the time is, is, is direct from voice. So everything that I, my education is actually very German. And then my, from a philosophical point of view, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student of Sartre. I'm a student of Camus. So between the French and German school of critical thinking, which is my position, it's very un-American. I'm not an, I'm actually, in a way, not an American artist. I don't, I was not educated to be an American artist. And I certainly was not educated to be a Chicago artist, whatever that means, right? So the House of American Girl was looking at an opportunity, a phenomena that occurred, which was Kavinsky. Theodore Kavinsky, for those who don't recognize his name, was a Unabomber. The Unabomber, he's an extraordinary figure. He killed the wrong people for the wrong reason, but he didn't have the wrong idea. Okay? Um, Kandinsky was a mathematical protege from Harvard. He was a very, very top of his field. He was brilliant. He was also the, the victim of behavioral modification programs that the U.S. government was running at Harvard at the time. And they had something happened in this program. Some distortion of his mind, something that they did, they broke him, they inserted a certain idea, something happened, we don't know what. I've read every book possible, every analysis that has ever been made of him, and they all point to the same cause, right? But Kudinsky is looking at the phenomena of technology, he's looking at the destruction of the environment, and he says no. And he, he secludes himself in Montana, in a little cabin, in the middle of nowhere, making bombs by the man who was doing a real thing and then blowing up scientists in, 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 in university. It, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a bizarre t- American tale, but it gets more complicated. The cabin that Kudinsky lived in, inside of the cabin when he was arrested, there were 350 canonical textbooks of Western civilization. History books. Mathematics. Science. Literature. You name the subject matter, he had the books. Yeah, you name the genius. The guy was a genius, he was, just, he was a distorted genius. He was, he was, he wanted to, to say no, but he couldn't say no in the way that he wanted to say no. He was obsessed with Jerome. He was obsessed with Jerome. In fact, as we talked about, he was a manifestation of Jerome. So if you look at what was fascinating for me about the cabin was when Kudinsky was captured. During the court trial, something I've never seen happen before, they took the cabin from Montana, they put it on a flatbed truck, and they, they transported it to the courtroom for the jury as forensic evidence of his insanity. Forensic evidence of his insanity because of the cabin he lived in. Now, that's funny to me because the cabin was an identical copy of Thoreau's cabin in Walden Pond. Identical. So, in, if using that logic, if Kandinsky is crazy for living in that cabin, so was Thoreau for living at Walton Pond, living in a little tiny cabin. So, there's, there's, there is an Americanness to this. It gets more complicated in my relationship with the cabin. My idea was to reproduce the cabin, but reproducing the cabin has to be bifurcated, it has to be bounced against something else. So, if Kandinsky represents American uh, terrorism, it represents a kind of pushback on a particular uh, ideological structure, it's a decision that's made. So there's, a, there's someone who was identical in age, identical in education, identical in every way, who took a different look, it was Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart is selling an idea of the American view that is impossible to obtain. Cupcakes and hot chocolate with marshmallows and she invented colors, that, that this is Martha Stewart colors. She's selling a fiction. It doesn't exist. So, but the two make a decision. So, Kudinsky decides he wants to blow people up and, 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 and be an American terrorist. And uh, Martha Stewart is the epitome of American capitalism. She sells nothing for a lot of money. It's complete air. There's nothing there. Nobody, I don't know why you would want it. Nobody, you would want, why would you care about this? But in America, we do care about this. We care about how, you know, how we paint the wall and how the cupcakes look and we mix this kind of cake and batters and this and that. I mean, there's something here that was a portrait of America, and by collapsing these two things together in one space, so I took Martha Stewart's color palette of the year of Kaginsky being captured by the police, and she puts out a new color palette every year. I adopted that color palette to Kaginsky's cabin, 
I, I installed the first version of this cabin here in New York at the Project Gallery, which I'm going to just throw a plug in for Christian. The Project Gallery, which is um, founded and run by Christian Hay, is probably one of the most exceptional and extraordinary galleries to ever exist in this country. The first uh, black African American uh, director, visionary, who reconstructed the very notion of what it meant to have a commercial gallery in the United States. This was, I mean, we did this at a time when nobody else was able to do this. I, I would make projects, I mean, we were together for 10 years. Any idea I had like this, you know, he would put it up, right? But the cabin is, it, it was again trying to um, make a critical inquiry into what is, what is it makes us American? What is, is, is there actually a way to define what that is? And how do we understand the tools and the parameters that are used against us? How are, how are we always subject to the institutional relationships that we are, find ourselves in every day? So this is a question that the cabin tried to raise. This is the House America Bill. The House America Bill was Martha Stewart and Peter Kavinsky. Capitalists and terrorists. Both psychopaths. Both psychopaths. Both both psychopaths, but also both uh, subjugating individualism as a foundation for U.S. society, which is what is so ironic about that. And you seem to have been putting a, a, a finger in the wound you know, very early on. Is because, I mean, the present crisis in American democracy proves, you know, the limits of that notion of individualism. And you seem to be have, have been pointing that out, you know, from, from that moment, you know, between that relationship between Thoreau and Kaczynski, you know, based on, on the notion of individualism. Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, thinking... It's like the underbelly of American democracy. But it's, but it's, but it's even more, I mean, if you, if you think about what, what has the United States done, right, I mean, in terms of uh, its contribution, well, it's, it has perfected predatory capitalism. <laughs> it's perfected it. Capitalism at this point is a perfect organism. It is so deceptive. It can exist anywhere, at any time. It is constantly evolving. It constantly decides itself as a chameleon. We are party to this kind of the, the vulgarity of this kind of capitalism and we don't even know it. We, we, we participate even if we're unwilling to participate. It also they perfected colonialism. I mean, for those of you who don't want to remember, but we live in the empire. We benefit from living in this empire, but we seem to be uncritical of the empire that we live in. We are so happy that we have Starbucks, right? We're so happy we have Whole Foods, and we're looking at iPhone, and all the things that we benefit from living in the empire, but we're uncritical of being in this empire. So that the idea of co the, co the American colonial project is extraordinary. It's all over the world. The other thing that they've done that is absolutely brilliant is they've convinced us that we have freedom. <laughs> they've convinced us that we have freedom when we actually have no freedom. They've convinced us that we have a choice when we actually have no choice at all. We don't understand that we're in a loop. We're in a cycle. And the cycle with many of these cycles they constantly looping over and over and over again. We have no freedom. We don't decide anything. My favorite, my favorite place to go is the grocery store, and you go in the grocery store, you go to the cereal aisle. <laughs> 200 boxes of cereal of every kind you can imagine. And then you realize two companies make all of them. They're just a hundred different names. Two companies make all the cereal. And you go, that's your choice. This is America, that's your choice. Go to the cereal aisle. Wow. They're all bad really for you. So <laughs> fucked. And they're all bad for you. <laughs> yeah, well, of course they're all bad for you. Know, what, everything, I mean, maybe something that's sold to us that's not bad for you. Right? Right? So, Anyway, there's something, the analysis here was always trying to, as you said, my friend, I live in a futurity, right? I live in the present moment. I'm, I'm less concerned with the past, even though I'm, as you both know, I'm a bit obsessed with history. And, and, and to, it's, it's to learn from history, to learn from those history. We do not seem to do well, because we're constantly repeating the same mistakes over and over again. But I'm here now. I want to live. I want to think about the conditions and the circumstances that we face today. And the only way we can do that is to be honest. And, and that honesty then helps us to imagine how to predict the position that, that we will take in the future. But if we don't act today in order to think about tomorrow, I mean, what is left for our children? What is left for the young? I mean, how are we supposed to establish a position that allows them 
to be able to manifest the ideas and the aesthetics and the ideas in, 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 in the ways of thinking that you get from the underlying ideas. Offers new ideas. Where are the new ideas? That's what I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. Why is there no more critical thinking? Why do we cause this, establish this sort of parameter of the ways to think about things? Um, we were going to ask you uh, to talk a little bit about the bottom line cost project as an extension of radical theory of action, but I actually think we've covered that. Okay. Um, and we're, we're going to run out of time really quickly. So I think I want to, let's move to the present. Okay. And you're, you recently spoke to me about this decision to, to leave the United States or to spend more time in Europe. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that's changed your uh, perception of the world, uh, your practice, perhaps, um, and how it sharpened <laughs> your critical eye. Or, or what is different about that environment that, that you don't find here in the States? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I'm splitting my time between here and Paris. Find it, I, I just got back from Chicago so that maybe that I immediately feel the same thing that I seem to always feel here. Like I, I am my my initial response is like I'm panicked. It feels extraordinarily claustrophobic here for me. And there and there's a I'm it's difficult to think here. There's a, it's it's difficult to focus here in a way that allows for the deep consideration that I find necessary in academic work is very difficult to do here because it, there's a lot of like static, a lot of chit chat, a lot of like noise here that is not productive, it's not constructive. Um, and, and again, the sort of the language of art here has changed. I mean, I think that there is, from the 20th century position to the 21st century position, I think that there is an, an anti intellectual move. I think there's an anti-critical move, there's an anti-theoretical. We are opposed to thinking for some reason all of a sudden that there is a art is no longer the value of art is no longer determined by critical analysis. It's determined by value, dollar value. So if something sells, somehow that makes it important. Well, in fact, that in my in, in from my point of view, from an historical point of view, that's simply not true. You can you, you, you can you can brand and advertise art all you want, that doesn't make the art any better. And it certainly doesn't allow the art to sustain itself in discourse. I'm talking about critical discourse with other artists. I'm talking about critical discourse with artists not only in this country, but artists in other countries. Uh, in, in Europe, they are, they are not burdened by the same discourse that we have in America because we are, are returning to being adult. We have different issues that face us. We have, we have serious issues that face us. We're not sure we're always paying attention to the issues that we should be focused on, right? So there's a freedom. The work here in America is uh, um, requires so much effort. Here. There's no. It is very difficult to find um, solidarity. It's difficult to find community. It's difficult to find discourse. Where in Europe, because the relationship to art is so, it's so long, it's so old, it's, it's matured in a way that's very really different, I, ha I quite honestly, I, I, I have much more success in Europe. The ideas are, the people are more open to the ideas. They're, 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 I get no pushback on them. And, and, and I, the question you asked in the beginning, no one would dare ask me this in Europe. Nobody would even think of asking me this question in Europe. They look at the work. And then all the other complications are, 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 are elicited, right? So there's, there still exists something that, that is very close to my heart. And you're right, Gilbert, when you said this. I mean, the Frankfurt School, Adorno, I mean, you know, philosophically, critically, these are the people that I, I, I find a connection to. I find a connection to the, the cultural resistance in Europe. I am, 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 am anti-fascist. 100%. Fascism is not acceptable in any terms and in any circumstances. In America, we, we have right-wing fascism and we have left-wing fascism. It's very simple. It's very true. And anybody that denies this is not paying attention to what is happening. This is not any particular group. It's not one particular person. But we have fascism on both sides. I don't, everybody's yelling at each other, telling everybody what to do. I don't want to participate in that. 
I don't because there's no. I mean, what's the benefit? I want to. I first and foremost, I support artists. I have always. I continue to support artists. That's the only thing that matters to me. And what matters then is their freedom. The freedom for artists to be able to render whatever ideas they want and not to be strapped down by any pre-existing ideas. We should be destroying categories, not building them up. It's, it's incredible to think that this is the position. Well, it, it, it's, that's, that's a very critical, very important point, because as you say, in Europe, you know, you've experienced the fact that people look at your work and then everything else falls through the work. Whereas here, we seem to be going back you know, to uh, way back to the 1960s and 70s, you know, where people are being categorized, you know, by certain, you know, maybe Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, you know, Latin American or white or et cetera. And we're all of a sudden, you know, we wait. And you and I have been in this, you know, for four decades. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we were there in the 90s, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Lord. And, you know, it's like nothing happened, you know, like not only the war was not won, but we're stuck in the same in the same situation. I mean, do you actually perceive any difference between you know what happened before and now? I think it's the same. No, it's, I, I agree with you. And, 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 and I think that I, mean, I, 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 I certainly do not want to speak for other ethnic groups in the United States, but I can speak for Latino, Mexicana, right, Mexican American. Yeah, I mean, the aesthetic that was established in the 1960s is exactly the same aesthetic that we have today. It, ha- it hasn't moved at all. And, and I, this always perplexed me. I, I, I didn't understand it. I didn't, never understood the idea, the, the idea to unlike an anyway. I didn't understand the border of the recession. I didn't understand altars. I didn't have to go out and do it for these kind of markers, these cultural markers that were borrowed from the from Tijuana, that were borrowed from the border, which had nothing to do with being Mexican American. Had nothing to do with growing up in Los Angeles or in Texas or wherever I mean, wherever Mexican Americans were growing up. I, or the idea that you know if you're you're Chicano, you make work about the border, right? This, like this, and then these prerequisites of making work. So, I, I, this was a revelation I had a while ago, but like, I never, it never came, became as clear. So, and, I, and, I, and, it, and it dawned on me modernism, modernism did not happen for everyone in the United States at the same time. Oh, that's a, that's a, yeah, for the rest of the world. Yeah, but, you know, but, 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 but modernism in Latin America, as you yeah. and I both know, was clearly there. You can look at the, I mean, the work coming out of Mexico City in the 90s was extraordinary. It was magnificent. People were experimenting, making things that were just beyond, you know, I'd go to Chile. I'd go to all over Latin America, Brazil, here, there, everywhere. Puerto Rico, Cuba, magnificent, right? But in the United States, Modernism did not develop simultaneously for minority communities, because minority communities were still fighting for their civil rights, their human rights. They were, we were still in a position of resistance. We were still in a position of trying to establish an identification, a tool of identification for ourselves. And this distracted us from this, this, the, the project of modernism. If you, can't, if you do not have modernism, you cannot have contemporary art. It's very simple. And so the, the, there's a delinquency in my opinion, in the, in, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, in the development of these ideas because they have not had the opportunity to grow. And this is based in education. You have to educate people. You have to teach, you have to study art history. You cannot make contemporary art if you do not study art history. You cannot make contemporary art if you do not study philosophy. You have, you have to have an ideological position. You have to have a, a, an intention has to be placed on how and why you make art, how you render meaning. The purpose of making art is to render meaning. And that meaning is connected to us, to the, all of the stories that all of us have had in all the community. The, the, the black community has been brilliant at this, to be perfectly honest. While the, I think that their, their development was also slower than, say, the white Americans, but they were able, they did something singular that we have not been able to do. Black America aesthetics, they recognize the benefit of embracing every aesthetic style and call it their own. So from the, from the work that is the most um, conceptual, abstract. abstract, to the work that is the most literal and the most obvious. They call it all their own because they understand the necessity for embracing the full spectrum of aesthetics. We do not do that in the Latino community. We are always at each other's throat. We are always each other. We, are, we're, we criticize each other rather than support each other. Well, what you're saying, what you're suggesting is that there's a reliance on a certain type of realism 
in a certain type of figurative language, yeah. that is the only way of expression, you know, for Chicano or Latino art. And that's just um, You know, that is, you do abstract art, or you do, you know, conceptual art, that you're separating yourself from, from any kind of meaningful understanding in the Latin community. Yeah. But in Chicano art, it was tied to a political movement. So if you were not part of that political movement, you couldn't call yourself a Chicano artist. It's sort of one and the same. So the minute you deviate from that, that's where the problems begin. Right, but I mean, same thing about that. I mean, in 1974, I think I was the first Chicano ever to go to formally go to art school. And it just happened to be that I happened to be a college at the time when you know, the, the most conceptual of conceptualists were teaching. So my entire introduction to this, that doesn't make me less political. I'm, as you both know, you know I, the, the political allure of the work has always been at the cutting end. I mean, I'm always at the edge of this. There's been, the, the, the politics, my analysis of American politics, American racism, American classism is, d- is deeply tied to, to what has happened to Black America, Latino America, Asian America, I mean, all of us. The, 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 all the, the, the LGBT community, I mean, it's the same. We've been assaulted. We've been marginalized. We have, we've been stripped of our ability to articulate our own position. And it, it, it doesn't, we should not, we should not reject the aesthetic position. We should embrace all these things. Why can't we have more people making conceptual work? I don't understand why this is a problem. But it apparently is. It's baffling to me. Baffling to me. Why do we do this? I was saying it more in terms of the Bohemian or in terms of yes, I'm, 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 I'm sure, 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 sure. I mean, but the civil rights thing that happened the same for us. The success of, of black civil rights is extraordinary. I mean, it's something to be marveled at. Civil rights for for Mexicans, for example, was the you know was Cesar Chavez. So we're not, we're talking we're not talking about civil rights for Chicanos. We're talking about labor. We're talking about labor. It wasn't actually civil rights for us as individuals. It's not the same. And again, the black community was incredibly successful because they used intelligence. They used they mobi- they mobilized all the tools necessary. I mean, you have to admit. I mean, I admire their their their, their, their fortitude, the, the 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 manner in which they craft and render meaning for themselves and interject this into the American landscape. I mean, I tell you what wouldn't happen. You could not. You couldn't invent the word Latinx in the black community. They wouldn't stand for it. They wouldn't stand to be defined like this because they simply would not allow an external idea to define them. And I, I admire this more than anybody because they have resilience. They have, they, 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 there's an understanding here that we've not achieved. They simply haven't done it. And, I, and it's, it, it breaks my heart to be part of this. It, t- it makes me incredibly sad. Why, why can't we not do it? Why can't we not author and render a position that is actually politically active. It is actually has some, you know, some agency to it. it, 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 it it's an efficacy of our ideas because of the consequence. I mean, what was it that led me through by him and that my the text was that I learned something. That you could actually make it a work of art and have a consequence. Being, action, consequence. Purely sucked. One hundred percent. Right? So it, it, we we have a lot of work to do, is what I think. And I think it'd be better if we got if we actually collaborated and acted like a community rather than you know, some of the ways that we have in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect ending. <laughs> Well, yeah, not I, think, perfect, I think people have, have, I think in the first of all, have, have, have questions and or comments to make, so should we open it up to uh, the audience? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm an artist. You hold a recent concession in recent years with identity politics has been Necessarily destructive, and has it been pushed by stuff or by corporate interests to drive it back to us? I don't I mean, I don't know exactly what that means. Well, I mean, it, what I was trying to suggest by discussing the age just, like, just in a sort of cursory manner that I did is that even if you look at the you look at American civil, black civil rights, and you look at May 68, 
which is a global student result, all the time in the world, in the world, you understand that the question of identity politics did not happen in the 20th century. Identity politics was being fought for in the 20th century. And then written by any in fact, was the, is the identity called so? I mean, that, that is, I mean, that's the marker that I have. I mean, that's what I've been mean, sort of, uh, Use the tag, you know, you know, I'm the one that's part of this, you know, I'm part of a group of people that initiated this this work, right? But it, it was done, as it was suggested, it was done through a non creative way, it was done through an intellectual framing. If you're talking about the divisiveness that we exist in now, I mean, if I was, if, if, if I was, if, if I mean, so what do we have? We have American oligarchs, we have American billionaires, we have corporations that seem to run it. I would perfectly inspire more division. The more divided we are, the more that we disagree on everything, the more that we fractionalize, the more that we tribalize, the more that we cannot find commonality. Yeah, what a perfect way to keep everybody uh, um, helpless, powerless. I think that would be a better part of our picture. Washington and tries to grab more money. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, if anybody believes that they're going to change America, any, any kind of ideological position in America by voting a Democrat or Republican, is naive. Nothing about voting does anything for us. Voting is a way to do a work as activity. There's no such thing as democracy. Democracy doesn't exist. They banned this in Athens a long time ago. The fact that we keep talking about, you can't say democracy without saying capitalist democracy. It's impossible. And what does it mean to have a capitalist democracy? Mm -hmm. You know, France is a socialist country. Remember, it's more pleasant to live there, to be quite honest. You don't have to deal with this. I mean, it's a lie. We live in a lie in this country. And yet, we perpetrate that with the lie. We just continue to live in a lie because it's all fine. You know, yeah. there's a problem in Ukraine. I don't see if you can talk about it. I can't talk about Ukraine. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Before we get there, is there yeah. any other, any other comment or question? Yes? It's more of a, hi, my name is Elia. <laughs> it's more of a comment to uh, the comparisons that we do, I know other people have done before, which is why is black America has it so together and Latinos do not. I felt somewhere in your conversation that it's a little bit contradictory because you talk about the divisions we have amongst Latinos. And I don't think it's a division. I think we just a multi, you know, a multiplicity of so many different things. But when you think of Black America, Black America is one identity. And so when you think about people standing and bonding together and doing what they have, what they've done so far within the arts and everything else, it's because they have that history. They have that one history that connects them. We don't have that one history. We have a multitude of histories. So I, I think to make that comparison is always a little bit problematic to me. I think you're right. I do agree that we are so divided, and I do agree we have to try to find a moment where we come together, which is why I never understand why people are against the word or against the idea of being called Latino and Latinx. We have to create a space, which is how I see the term Latinx. I don't see it as an identity, but more an idea or a place to start, if you will, um, of unity. Thank you. It's seen by a number of people as a place to coalesce a movement. You know, it's a space, as you say, uh, for people who have been marginalized both within Latin America as well as within the U.S. And it's an extremely complex, um, complex category. Uh, but but it is seen by a number of people. I mean, I mean, the progressive view of Latinx is to see it as a space that differentiates people. You know, against you know both the colonial and imperial Latin America and. and Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just have to do one point on that. I, I put it there saying I made that comparison on purpose like that because I'm, I'm trying to make a point. And the point is simply uh, I do not understand the issues of the Cuban Americans or Cuba in, in Miami or in Florida, for example. I, I do not understand the issues of Puerto Rico. Okay? I understand the issues of being Mexican in America. 
And the problem for me is that we continue, I mean, the term Latin American is offensive to me. The term Hispanic is offensive to me. The term Latino is offensive to me. All of these terms are offensive to me. And I disagree with you that they're not a starting point. As soon as you label us the way that you're, that we are continuing to use label after label after label, we just cut ourselves off at the feet. There is no way to move. You cannot make labels and say that we are going to we were to advance an ideological or political position. As soon as you put a label on something, as soon as you self-identify, you have, you have stopped the ability to evolve. You cannot evolve. You cannot say Latino and evolve because Latino doesn't mean anything. I mean, Mosquera's position in Latin America is it's a colonial term. There is no such thing as Latin America. But, and why does Latin America stop at the border? I'm Latin American. So what do you offer then for us to come together? I mean, that, that's it. Let's, okay, let's take those terms all off the table. So then what do we have? Where do we start? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. And that's the thing because, you know, that's, that's my big point. Like, where do we start? Where do we put this whole... We're all here to uplift and show the, the value and the importance that Latinos, for lack of a better word, the Latinx people, are very much uh, important to, to America but as the invisibility. But they're not. We are not important to America. I understand what you mean. But, but, we're not, but we're, we are not part of the American cultural discourse. We're not represented. But isn't that what we're trying to do? Is the yes, whole point of this thing here? What well, I want the thing here. <laughs> no, I don't want to about the thing here. <laughs> no, no, no. What, what we should do, why don't we let artists leave the field? I just wanted to offer, um, just to make sure that we're not being reductive, um, that the black experience in America is not a singular experience. And I just, yeah, I just wanted to offer that there's nuance in all of these communities, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't being reductive in the way that we're talking about other people's experiences. That's all. Well, there's no offense, and you know, we're just trying to have a dialogue. So I don't think he or I or anyone has any intent on this. Um, we, we need to have more conversation. We need lots of conversation, and we need. To be, and again, I would argue that we should instead of. Uh, Institutions, curators, uh, directors, all that. instead of allowing these people to all lead this conversation, you should let artists lead this conversation. People should follow and pay attention to what artists are doing first instead of telling the artists what they should be doing or right? expecting artists to do a certain thing. We don't do that anymore. Artists are the last, we're the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, whatever. I don't even know what to call them anymore. You know, but we're commodified. We're commodified. We, we rely ourselves to be commodified. Our identity is commodified. Our sexuality is commodified. Our gender is commodified. Really, that's what we want to do. We want to sell our identity. That's the, that's the objective. That's not the objective for me. It, it, it just simply can't be. But your question is good. What do we do? And I would argue that there's one thing we do. We need education. We need to educate. Educate, 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 educate. We have to stop acting like we're in the ghetto. We have to stop acting like we, we are just helpless. Or that we are we construct our identity about being victims. I am not a victim. I refuse to be a victim in America. I don't care what has happened. I refuse to adopt this position. But we adopt a position of victimization. And as long as we act as victims, we're gonna lose. We're losing. Why I don't know why this is so hard for people to figure out. We are losing this battle in America. There is twenty-three million Latinos in this country. We have no political clout, we have no cultural influence. Our, the, 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 our, the money that you, is being spent by Latinos in this country doesn't even seem to register or anything. We're, we're just, we're, we're, I mean, wow. We've been rendered invisible. And we, we don't participate in anything. And, 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 and somehow we're, we're, we're obsessed with what conversation. If I had to construct, if I had to make a list of the, the crises that we face as pan Latino in America, this conversation isn't one of them. We face epic, epic crises that we are not paying attention to. We are not addressing properly. We are not using our intellect. We are not using history. We are not using the power of the people that are possible to, to establish new cultural position for a pan latino position in America where we are taken seriously. This is what I want. This is the objective. We have to completely change this, this program. 
A whole thing has to change, and we have to do this with as much aggression as necessary. Being passive is I'm done with it. I'm done. It's over. It's over. No more than like a passive Latino is just like taking whatever comes and crumbs off the table. Fuck that. I'm not going to do it anymore. No, 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 no. Thank you. Thanks to you. Do we have any other comments? Questions? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you to the Armory.